I'm going to finish the six lies of the devil. Have you enjoyed this series? Hopefully you've learned something. Some of you may have already forgotten a few things, so I'm going to remind you of the first six lies of the devil that we talked about. We said that, number one, that the lie is that Satan does not exist. Second lie was that somehow God is holding out on you. The third lie, and we spent a whole Sunday on this, is that God cannot be trusted. Then we spent a whole Sunday on sin carries no consequences. And then last week we finished up lies five and six. And lie five is you can be like God. And lie six is if it feels good, do it. And throughout our lives, the enemy will bombard our minds with those six thoughts. And he will lie to you about it. And then he'll even lie about you. And then ultimately, when you begin to believe the truth, then he'll come and say that you're believing a lie. That's what he does. But my prayer is that over the last few weeks, you've learned that those lies just do not hold up against God's word. And see, when you begin to allow the truth of God's word uh, to wash over your life, it washes away those lies and the effects of those lies. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 26, they're talking about the church and what kind of a church would be presented to God at the end of time. And in that little text there, he says that he, may, he might sanctify and cleanse her, speaking of the church, so he's talking about you, with the washing of water by the word. And so whenever the lies come in, how we refute those lies and how we defeat those lies and how we remove those lies out of our lives is to be washed by the water of the word. But often what happens is, is life gets busy, we get tied up, we, we kind of forget some of God's truth and we get dirty. And we fail and then we believe the lies and we begin to believe the liar. And it's at that moment that the lies and the liar tries to control our lives. And it's when that happens, that's when you become like a little boy named Johnny. Johnny was visiting his grandparents, and Johnny had just received his first slingshot. Johnny took his little slingshot, and he went out into the woods to begin to practice hitting a target. He never hit the target. So he goes back towards Grandma's backyard. He's defeated, and on his way back, he notices Grandma's pet duck. And on an impulse that only a little boy can have, he raises up that slingshot, fires that rock. The stone hit dead center and killed the duck. He began to go into a panic because he had just killed Grandma's duck. And his sister saw the whole thing happen. She said nothing. After lunch that day, Grandma said, Sally, let's wash the dishes. Sally said, Johnny told me he wanted to help in the kitchen. <laughs> Didn't you, Johnny? Remember the duck? So Johnny washed the dishes. Later that day, Grandpa offered to take both the kids fishing. But Grandma said, oh, no, no, wait a second. I want Sally to help me make supper. <laughs> Sally smiled and said, Johnny wants to do it. Remember the duck, Johnny? So Johnny helped Grandma prepare dinner while Sally went fishing with Grandpa. After several days of doing both his and Sally's chores. He just could not stand it anymore. And he went and he confessed to his grandmother that he had killed her favorite duck. She said, I know. She gave him a big hug. She said, I was standing at the window and I saw the whole thing happen. But I love you more than that duck and I forgave you. I was just wondering how long you would let Sally make a slave out of you. That's what happens to many Christians. We live our lives like slaves to the devil. 
we begin to believe his lies more than we begin to trust God. And the enemy's tactic is to deceive God's people into believing those lies. And when we do that, we make the truth of God of ill effect in our lives. The devil acts just like Johnny's sister. He wields the lies of unforgiveness over you. And then that paralyzes you from ever living a life of freedom in Christ. See, the devil knows that many people are unable to separate their who from their do. We simply just cannot accept that we have been made righteous by what Christ did instead of what we do. Our enemy likes to constantly remind all of us of our weaknesses, our mistakes, our sins. And by doing this, he's setting you up to live an endless cycle of comparison and competition with others, causing shame, judgment, and then puts a constant nagging feeling that you're never going to be good enough, always reminding you of your duck. See, God's really not like that at all. In Ephesians chapter 1, verses 4 and 5, it tells us that he chose us in him before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless before him in love. He predestined us to adoption as sons to himself through Jesus Christ according to the good pleasure of his will. Verse 7 of that same chapter, in him we have redemption through his blood and the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. See, we are not slaves, nor are we sinners. We are actually the sons of God. We are joint heirs with Christ. I've seen a billboard the last few weeks, and I understand kind of what they're saying, but I disagree with it. The question is posed on the billboard, are you a sinner? Good news, so are we. No, I'm not. I was a sinner. I've been saved by grace, and I am now a son of God. The devil would tell you that you're a sinner, constantly reminding you of your duck, of your failure, of your mistake. But that's not who I am anymore. I have been washed by the blood of Jesus Christ. I have been set free from my past. And I am now a son of God, a joint heir with Christ. Because a sinner doesn't have authority, but a son does. See, when you begin to believe those lies, the lies of the devil, you've lost the identity of who you are in Christ, and you've lost the truth of whose you are. See, the devil will tell all of us that God is somehow holding out on us. When in fact, because of who you are in Christ, you have power and authority because of that relationship. See, the devil will tell you that you are nothing. You have no power, nor do you have any authority. And actually, there could be nothing further from the truth. We, the people of God, have power to bind and to loose. And the reason why we have that power is because of the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ and his finished work at Calvary. He finished it. He took the keys of death, hell, and the grave. And he gave those keys of the kingdom to the church in Matthew chapter 16 and verse 19. In other words, he gave those keys to the 11 o'clock service at SIWC. He gave the keys of the kingdom to the church. He gave you power and authority. And you should utilize that authority to bind and to loose. Now the word binding, we don't really use that word much anymore. But the word binding is just another way of saying to hold on to something. The Apostle Paul was writing to a church in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. It was the church of Thessalonica. And he begins to encourage the church. And let me read about 10 verses to you out of 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 14 through 24. And I read out of the New King James Version. He says, now we exhort you, brethren. Now he's not talking to demons. He's not talking to angelic beings. He's not talking to the world. He's talking to brethren. He says, brethren, warn those who are unruly, comfort the faint-hearted, uphold the weak, 
be patient with all. And see that no one renders evil for evil to anyone, but always pursue what is good both for yourselves and for all. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Verse 19, do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophecies. Verse 21, test all things. Hold fast what is good. Abstain from every form of evil. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. And may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful who will also will do it. Now he says in verse 21, he says to test all things. Earlier he said in the scripture that we should try the spirits. And see if it be an angel of light or an angel of darkness. And if it's an angel of light, you hold on to that. If it's an angel of darkness, you kick that out. Here he says you should test all things. And once you have tested it and you see that it is good, then you keep that. But if it's not good, let you all remember the adage, you can eat meat and spit out bones. In this case, you should take the word of God and his truth and you should keep it. And if it's bad and the enemy's lying to you, you should kick that out of your life. We have way too many people getting all close and hunky-dory with the enemy and kicking the truth out. When in reality, we should hold fast to the truth and kick the lies out. So Paul says there are some things that we need to hold fast to. Hold fast to those things that are good. Now, the enemy would tell you that we should give all of this up. But the scripture said to hold fast. In the book of Revelation, he said, hold fast to the things which thou hast professed. Hold on and hold fast to your first love. Hold on to sound doctrine. Hold on to those things. So I thought today that to end this series, I would tell you about some things that I have tested. I have found them to be worthy of hanging on to. And I believe that you likewise should hold on to them. I have found these things to be good in our lives. Number one, we should hold fast, we should hold on to the absolute authority of the Word of God. Now people will tell you, well, the Bible was written for a different time and season. That the Bible, you know, it was good for them way back then. So let me just counteract that lie. See, time does change. God never does. He said, my word, everything else will pass away. Heaven and earth will pass away. But my word will stand forever. That's why people want to know what I believe, what the church stands for. Listen, we stand for the Bible. And it doesn't matter what I personally believe. Because what I, what I believe does not line up to the word of God. Then what you think is right that I believe will make you contrary to the word of God. And you're not going to be judged by Pastor Jason. You're going to be judged by the word of God. And this word will never pass away. So we need to hold fast to the absolute authority of the word of God. Paul wrote to Timothy. And he says in verse 14, But you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them. Verse 15, and that from childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Now we're going to learn a little Greek and Hebrew here. All in Greek means all. In Hebrew, the word all means all. All Scripture. So I hear people say all the time, well, you know what? The Holy Spirit really isn't for today. Then what do you do with the book of Acts? God's grace is not the same as it used to be. Then what do you do with the book of Romans? Uh, There are people that want to pull parts of the scripture out and say, that was written for a different time. But Paul wrote to Timothy, and Pastor Jason's now telling you, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. All of it is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete. See, if you take out part of it, you're incomplete. you got to have all of the Word of God. Thoroughly equipped for every 
good work, we should hold fast to the absolute authority of the Word of God. Secondly, we must hold on to sound doctrine because the enemy of our souls will produce and is producing counterfeit doctrine. You can read 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 3. He will also produce counterfeit gospels. I hear people say, you know, whichever way you want to believe, that will get you to heaven. No, I'm sorry. The scripture says about Jesus, and Jesus said it himself, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. Not a way, not a a life, no, I am the way, the life. Now, you can serve that other God, you just won't end up where you think you're going to end up. And we must be just dead set on this doctrine that Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven. You cannot go through any other door. Listen, there's four doors to this church you can get in here, but there's only one door to heaven, and it is through Jesus Christ. My friend, that's the doctrine. I didn't write it. Jesus said it, and he is the way, the truth, and the life. The enemy will also produce a counterfeit communion. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 20 and 21. We must be assured of why we're taking communion, and we're going to do it on Wednesday night, and what we are to remember when we take communion. We're not remembering other gods. We're remembering the death of the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ and that his body was broken for us and that his blood was shed for us and that is the covenant that God made with us and we can stand upon that. My friend, we must hold fast to sound doctrine. Here's what Paul wrote to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 2 through 4. He said, preach the word. Don't preach your opinion, preach the word. And you are all preachers. Then he says, be ready in season and out of season. Now, in Illinois, we only have two seasons. We have construction and winter. But in the church being saved, there's not two seasons. There's one season. It's the season to be ready. We must always be ready to preach the word. When you come upon somebody who needs a word of encouragement, you need to be prepared to preach the word in season, whether you're at church or you're out of season or whether you're at home, you need to be ready to preach the word. He says to be ready in season and out of season, convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. I believe we're in that day. We must hold fast to sound doctrine. Number three, we must hold fast to personal holiness. Now, the reason why I put this as number three is because as soon as I say personal holiness, people say, oh, he's about to get all legalistic. No, I'm not. We got to hold fast to personal holiness. And personal holiness comes about through a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. I don't preach pastoral standards here. Because if I preach pastoral standards, as soon as you leave my presence, you feel like you can do those things. Or if Pastor Jason doesn't know about it, then we're okay. I preach personal relationship because wherever you go, Jesus is there. And there are just some things, now listen, in my relationship with Christ that I do, and there's some things I don't do because of my personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, it may not be what you have to do with Jesus or for Jesus, but it's what I have to do because I have a personal relationship with Jesus for myself. So let me just liken it like this with Melissa and I in our marriage. Most of you are married or you want to be married. Or, and in that relationship that you have, you know what makes your spouse happy. Now, you may not always like it. Like me, I know that purses make Melissa joyful. I don't like purses. I've never carried a purse. I think they're overpriced. And... Amen, come on now. Mm, felt my help coming right there. All the men in the house just, just amen me silently, and I know we're in agreement. 
And there's all kinds of other fellas involved in my marriage. There's Michael. <laughs> Coors. Louis. Uh, Vuitton. Henry. Bindle. And they're all involved in my marriage. But it makes Melissa happy. And then I watch Melissa get all joyful about it for like a week. And then we got to go get another one. And then she gives the other ones away. And it just irritates her. But that, in my relationship, is what makes Melissa happy. And I've learned. See, I'm disciplined. And we are supposed to be disciples. See, anybody can be a believer. And see, a believer, though, is not a participant. See, I believe in the Cardinals. I'm a fan. I'm a follower of the Cardinals. But I'm not a participant in the game. If I got on the team and got drafted by the team to play them, then the whole thing is different. We are not just believers, but we are disciples. In other words, we're participants. And the word disciple means the disciplined ones. And I've been in my marriage long enough, I've been disciplined enough, y'all, that I know that purses make my spouse happy. In your personal relationship with Jesus Christ, when you are disciplined, you'll find out what makes Jesus happy, and you'll do it because you're in a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. We have to hold fast to personal holiness. Now, Colossians, 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1. Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves. Notice it doesn't say the pastor is to cleanse you. It says, let us cleanse ourselves. In other words, you've got to get a personal relationship with Christ so that you know what you should be cleansed from. Because you all do a wonderful job of hiding all your junk from me. But you're not hiding any of that from God. And when you talk to God, he'll show you what areas you need to cleanse yourself from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. We have to hold fast to personal holiness. Number four, we have to hold on to spiritual authority. Let me, let me just paraphrase this a little bit. What I mean by that is that Jesus Christ is the head of our lives. That Jesus Christ is number one. And if Jesus doesn't like it, I won't do it. And if Jesus likes it, I'll do it. He is the head of all things. Let me read some scripture. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 22 and 23. And he put all things. What did he put under his feet? All things under his feet. And gave him to be head over some things. Like this side of the church is doing amazing. And he gave him to be head over all things to the church which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. You know why I know you all doing so awesome? This is the ear that I'm actually deaf in, and I heard you all. All right? So he fills them all in all. Now, Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 18. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on the earth. Visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church. Who's in charge of the church? It's not me. It's Jesus. Who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. Listen, Jesus Christ needs to be your number one. And if Christ is not your number one in your life, then your life is out of order. And if your life is out of order in that area, I promise you, you'll have all kinds of other disorder in your life. And then I will quote this scripture to you. For God is not the author of confusion. God is not the author of all of that disorder that's going on in your life. And the way to get the rest of your life in order is to get right in the proper order with Christ. He's first and you're underneath him. What we have now is we think we're over the top of Christ and we can order Christ around like we're the puppet master and he's the puppet. When in reality, he's the master and I'm the servant. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 and 20, he came and spoke to them saying, all authority, how much authority? Oh, man, everybody, amazing. Has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all the things that I have commanded you. And remember this, I am with you always, 
even when times change. Even when you don't think I'm there, you think your country's going down the, word, the tubes, you remember I'm with you. Lo, I will be with you even to the end of the age. We must hold on to the fact that he is the spiritual head. He is the preeminent power in heaven and on earth. And he's with us. And because of that, here's number five. We must hold on to the truth that we, the believers, the disciplined ones, the disciples, we have authority as well. Now, Paul, now many people say, you know, about pride. You know, pride cometh before the fall. First of all, you're misquoting that scripture. It talks about a haughty spirit. Pride goes before destruction. So you're not even quoting it right. I love all these people who want to correct me as the pastor and they can't even get the scripture right that they're quoting. Paul is talking about our authority. And he said, I want to boast of our authority. I want, I, and even if, even if I boasted about our authority, no matter how much I boasted about it, I still would not even be scratching the surface of how much authority we have. Let me read it to you in 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 8. For even if I should boast somewhat more about our authority, which the Lord gave us for edification and not for destruction. See, so I want to boast about this. We have authority and it is for our edification, which means the lifting up of the body of Christ or the lifting up of the person who is in Christ. I want to boast about that authority. And it wasn't given to us for our destruction it was given to us to lift us up. And the reason why many people are not lifted up is because they are not using their authority. And the reason why people are underneath it all the time is because they're afraid of that authority. Because we've taken parts of the Bible out and said, oh, that stuff was for a different time and a different age. And I hear people say, you know what? I was happy at the church of the first frigid air. I like it quiet. I don't like all this worship. I don't understand people. Listen, whenever the Holy Spirit comes around, and I can't throw the Holy Spirit out because I'd have to take out the entire book of Acts. Matter of fact, I'd have to scratch out every verse from Genesis chapter 1 when the spirit of the Lord God came upon the face of the earth and he saw confusion and he caused order to, I'd have to take out the whole Bible and we're not going to do that because we're holding fast to the absolute authority of scripture so when the Holy Spirit comes the Bible says it comes and when it comes it comes as a sound I like it quiet. Then you don't like when the Spirit comes in. The Holy Spirit will come as a sound of a mighty rushing wind. It'll be like a torrential, y'all. Y'all remember May 8th? When the wind came, it just wiped out everything that wasn't rooted and grounded. And when the wind comes, and a lot, a lot of reason why people, I'm preaching almost prophetic now. A lot of reason why people don't want the Holy Spirit to begin to blow is because they're not rooted and grounded in truth. They're rooted and grounded in their tradition. And they don't want anybody else to have the wind of the Holy Spirit because then we'll be cleansed from all fleshly things and spiritual things. There's way too many people promoting false doctrines. And it's time that the real church stood up and said, go ahead and let the wind blow to get some of the flakes and the fluff out of the church and the real church will remain rooted and grounded in truth. And we ought to boast about that. We ought not to be ashamed of our authority. We should boast about our authority. Well, I don't know if you want to say that kind of stuff, preacher. The devil may notice. Oh, I hope he does. We have authority. We have authority to preach this message. Mark chapter 16, verses 15 through 18. And he said to them, I didn't say he said to Pastor Jason, go into all the world, Jason. No, he said, all y'all, all you 11 o'clock crowd at SIWC, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. But he who does not believe will be condemned. Verse 17, and these signs will follow those who believe. Now, I just want to pause there. I hear all kinds of people. I've never seen anything like it except when I came to Southern Illinois. I see all kinds of people running around looking for a sign. I'm looking for revival. I, I need to move over here. Maybe God's over here. You are incorrect theologically. You are following after a sign. 
The scripture just said that the sign will follow you. And if you want miracles and you want signs and you want wonders and you want revival, then all you have to do, my friend, is stop running around and just believe and the sign will follow you. You're wearing yourself out looking for revival when you are the revival, when you are the fire, when you are the miracle, you are the sign, you are the wonder. They will follow you. May I also say preaching came first. He said, go preach and then signs will follow. We got way too many people don't want any preaching in their life. They just want miracles and signs and wonders. We just want to sit here and soak a while. You are saved by the foolishness of preaching. Music won't save you. Miracles won't save you. Signs won't save you. The scripture said it's by the foolishness of preaching that you're saved. Man, I don't know what just happened in this house, but I love it. All right, let me continue. In my name, they will cast out demons. Oh, y'all believe that? Yeah, we're a church, y'all. Demons. And if you don't believe in demons, that's because you believe in one. He's got you so tricked that you think you're right. That addiction in your life is not right. That's a demon lying to you. And we have authority to cast that demon out of your life. And when you get free, you'll go home and set your family free. And that's why the devil likes you not believing in all this stuff. That's why your marriage is a mess, your home is a mess, your job's a mess. There's a demon lying to you. And it's time that you took your God-given authority and you cast the demon out of your life. You know, this is why, this is why it lies to you. See, the Bible says that the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead now, the enemy thought he had killed Jesus, he had stolen his crown, and he destroyed his kingdom. And then he's standing there throwing a party in hell. I killed him, I destroyed him, and I stole him. I got his glory, I got his kingdom, and I took his life. And Jesus come walking in the door and said, you didn't do any of that. Give me those keys. And he brought those keys, and he gave them to the church. And the enemy thinks he's stealing from you and killing you and destroying you. And some of you need to show up at his party when he thinks he's destroyed your marriage, destroyed your life, destroyed your children, destroyed you through an addiction. You need to walk in there and rattle them keys of authority that Jesus Christ gave you and say the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead lives inside of me. And I have authority that you cannot kill me, you cannot destroy me, and you cannot steal from me. It's the same power. You thought you did it to Jesus, and you thought you did it to Jason, but I'm here to say, no, 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 you have not. So you can cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues, and I don't have time to get into that other than to say it just like this. Zephaniah said that he would speak to his people in a pure language. There is not a language on the earth that is pure. We need new tongues. Because the old tongue is a cursing tongue. In every language, we can curse, we can vex, and we can hex. But there is a language. It's called the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That you can talk to God, not with an old tongue, but with a new tongue that is filled with His Spirit. And it is a blessing tongue. It is an authority tongue. And when you don't know how to pray under the old man, the Spirit says, when you don't know how to pray, the Spirit, the new tongue, will make intercession for you. Because there's times where I read the prayer request and I'm like, oh my God, oh my God. And then all of a sudden, the spirit man steps in. My flesh man says, oh, they're going to die. But the spirit man steps in and says, they shall not die, but they shall live and declare the works of the Lord. We need new tongues in our life. Now, verse 18, some of y'all want to take this too little. Let me just say this. It says, they will take up serpents. If any of y'all throw a snake on the floor, I'm going to be the first one to run the aisles. Gone, baby. I'll be out of here fast. And I'll trip a few of you so there's food on the floor and I'm gone. <laughs> they will take up serpents. And if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. And they will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. You know why we don't see a whole lot of people recovering? Because we've gotten comfortable laying hands on the healthy. We like praying for saved people. We like praying for clean people. We like praying for righteous people. And then we judge all the other people. If you want people to get healthy, you got to go find the sick people. And you got to lay hands. It means you got to get involved. 
Oh, I pray for y'all down there in Cairo. I'll be with you in spirit. I've never seen a spirit give, shake a hand, or hug a neck. You have to go physically and lay hands on it for it to be healthy. Do the work of the ministry. They will lay hands on the sick and what? They will recover. So we have authority to stand against the devil, to resist him, to throw him out, to cast him out, and to declare and decree the will of heaven on earth. I'm going to hurry to a close. See, the liar of our souls will say, you have no right. But the Lord said, go into all the world and preach. The liar says, you cannot do it. There's no way that it can be done. But the Lord says, you're more than a conqueror and you can do all things through Christ Jesus. The liar will tell you, parents, your children will never be saved. But Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 14 says, Are they not all ministering spirits set forth to minister for those who will inherit the salvation? The liar says some of you are going to die, that this sickness is unto death. The scripture says in Psalm 118 verse 17, I shall not die but live and declare the works of the Lord. It says he will heal all of your diseases in Psalm 103 and verse 3. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 24, by whose stripes you were healed. The liar will tell many of you like this, you can't find forgiveness. Psalm 103 verse 3, and I think the psalmist put those two moments of truth together because the liar uses these two lies on church people the most. That sickness is unto death and you'll never find forgiveness. And so God wrapped up a bunch of truth in one verse. And it says, he will heal all of your diseases who forgiveth all of your iniquities. Every one of them. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24, who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree that we, having died of sins, might live for righteousness. 1 John chapter 1, verses 8 and 9, if we confess our sins, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So the question over the last few weeks is this, who will you believe? Will you believe the liar or will you believe the Savior? Which one will you believe? See, many of us, we don't think we can ever find forgiveness in our lives. And every time we start moving towards the Savior, the enemy will remind you of your duck. God says, I'm going to cleanse you. And the enemy says, you remember that duck? Yes, I do. I remember that duck. But Jesus doesn't. He was watching from the window, and he's seen me do it. And he forgave me, and he doesn't remember the duck anymore. And then when I finally got fed up with all of those lies, and I went to Jesus, and I said, you remember the duck? I said, I've seen you do it. But I loved you more than I loved that duck. But I didn't know how much he loved me until I went and confessed to him that I'd killed his duck. And when I confessed to him, he was faithful and he was just to forgive me. And I realized after I confessed that he really did love me more than he loved the duck. I would have never known that until I decided I would no longer be a slave to the lie. Instead, I wanted to have a relationship with the truth. And once you know the truth, the truth will set you free. And when the truth sets you free, you shall be free indeed.